Hi, everybody. I am going to start recording my lecture on ophthalmic surgery. So we are going to talk about my slideshow with you. So this chapter is very different from our other chapters. So we're working on one specific body part, very different. So even though we kind of do that in other specialties, like let's say neurosurgery, you still have options, right? You could be working on the brain or the spine. ENT, you have so many options. Orthopedics, so many options. Ophthalmic, not a lot of options. You're just working on the eye. But there are lots of specialty instruments with it. So I will go ahead and start with that. So I'm on page 588. And this is chapter 16, ophthalmic surgery. So the introduction. There's a lot of different machines and equipment that you might need to do these procedures. So it kind of hits the equipment in that first little paragraph. So if you need some visuals for what it is talking about, here is your operating microscope. That's one of the first things it talks about. And then it also talks about the FACO emulsification machine. So that's pronounced FACO emulsification, but they're just gonna call it the FACO machine. So even if you don't know what it is, you can always go grab it. If somebody says, hey, I need the FACO machine, go get it for me. So this is what it looks like, and this is what your handpiece that the surgeon will be using looks like too. So I'll hit that again when we hit equipment, but let's go to instruments, routine equipment, and supplies. So this part's really easy. You need to read through and know the names of all of these instruments, especially the ones that are pictured in your textbook. You know that you also have your orange book, so go through your orange book and learn all of those instruments. This section actually focuses on some microsurgical instruments that aren't just for ophthalmic surgery. So it's a really good chance for you to learn some instruments that you're not going to be using as often. You definitely won't be using them in the lab, so that's a good hint to you that this is the only time you're gonna see it until you get out to externship. So this is a good time to really get these in your mind and try to memorize these names. So as you go through the four steps, I won't read them to you, but again, everything on all of the instrument pages you should be familiar with. Let's look at forceps. You've got good pictures. For example, your Bishop Harmon iris forceps. They may not call them Bishop Harmon. They may just call them iris forceps. They're used a lot in eye surgery. And there's a couple other examples. And I'll point that out to you so you know what the surgeon's going to call it versus the technical term, which you need to know also. Um, looking at your needle holders, so it says it on 588, but you can see a picture on 589 of your Castro Viejo locking needle holder. So this might be the first time you guys have seen these, but you'll use these in many other specialties. They're just different sizes. Example, cardiac surgery or cardiovascular surgery surgery. They will uh, load very small sutures for anastomosis, which hopefully you already remember what kind of suture that is, a specific suture on a specific needle, the double-armed. You can only load those on these Castro Viejo needle drivers. So you have to really have finesse and be able to click it just right so that the small attachments lock in the center of the forcep. So take a good look at that picture and think about these are the days where you don't want to drink a lot of coffee. You want to be able to be nice and steady to be able to clamp that needle into that Castro Viejo forcep. So this is a very uh, delicate specialty. It'll be less of these slapping instruments into the arms and more of placing it in a way that they can feel it hit their hand, but it's such a delicate micro instrument you won't be able to pop it into their hand like we do with all other instruments. So there's your needle drivers. You can also look at your scalpels. So this is a little bit different because you'll have keratomes that are disposable. So these are specific blades that are at different angles and different sizes for the surgeon, specific for eye surgery. Another one are the diamond knife blades. These are also disposable beaver blades. And then you know what a 15 knife blade is. So this is for more involved surgery it's more likely that you'll be using keratomes, beaver blades, and diamond knife blades in eye surgery, because we don't really make big incisions with big blades into our eyes. 
Look at page 589. So we can start with the specific forcep that they use to remove chalazions. So Desmaris chalazion forceps. So recognize that. Also definitely recognize your Desmaris lid retractor. This one I've actually used in other specialties too, but it is made for eye surgery, lid retractor. And then we can look at our scissors. So the pictures are on the next page, but I want you to recognize at least three scissors as these are for eye surgery. So eye surgery scissors, Westcott scissors. These are spring action, very small. I believe you can see it on the next page. Now they have the Venus, but they're very similar. So Westcott scissors. And then your McPherson's Venus Iris scissors, which are on the next page. So this one say it has that same spring action in the center, but they are more commonly referred to as just plain iris scissors. So some would specify that for the handle because there are some handheld iris scissors that look like regular scissors it can get a little confusing. So again, look at your orange book and learn the technical terms for these different scissors and instruments. Okay. After scissors, it has miscellaneous, and we're gonna use a lot of lacrimal duct probes in eye surgery. So these are small probes to be able to dilate or probe inside the lacrimal duct of our eyes. Okay, so those pictures are on page 590, so I'll flip over there again for a second. You can see your specific Bowman's probe, and that's figure 16-6. So again, this one is another eye probe. So lacrimal probe is a term you wanna be familiar with. And a Bowman's probe specifically is a type of lacrimal probe. Okay, I think we got the main instrumentations. Let's go to equipment. So routine equipment at the bottom of 589. I want you to know that we're gonna be using an ophthalmic stretcher for these cases. So it's a bed that's specific for eye surgery to make it comfortable for the surgeon. So if you're doing an eye surgery, it's many times gonna be on that stretcher and ophthalmic stretcher so the patient doesn't have to be moved. Very convenient, makes it easy for the operating room team. Okay, and then back on page 590, you'll see your microscope pictured on my slide, but they could also use loops. So I need you to make that note. So if it's not, doesn't need to be magnified enough to use a microscope, they might just wear their loops. Okay, after that, it talks about the vitrectomy system. So in your book, it says vetrioretinal system, very specific, but this is talking about the different chambers of the eye. After that, it talks about lasers. So no, you could use the argon or the YAG laser coagulation, just like we do in other types of surgery. So to coagulate some tissue. After that, look at cryotherapy. This one is used more with eyes than other uh, specialties. So you need to pay a little extra attention to it. So know what cryotherapy unit is and know that it can be used to treat ret retinal detachment. So that's when the retina is completely detached. Um, it's used a uh, localized cold temperature to seal the tears and the holes. So that means it's going to be in a whole unit. They're going to call it a diathermy unit, but they're going to use it to seal little tears that are on the retina usually, so a torn retina. If it's small enough, they can repair it with cryotherapy. So they can seal that hole with that cold temperature. So they're gonna use nitrous oxide gas passed under that pressure to accomplish this. But I want you to know what cryotherapy is and what it's going to accomplish in eye surgery. After that, you need to know all of your routine supplies. So read through those. You can pay attention to your wet cell sponges. Those are specific sponges for eye surgery that I will show you in class. A lint-free micro wipe sponge. 
This is because they're working under a microscope. They're very fine and in tune with everything. So if you get so much as a little fiber off of your blue towel onto your instrument, when they bring it under the microscope, it's gonna look huge and it's gonna block their view. So making sure to wipe every instrument off with that instrument wipe is very important for the surgeon. Uh, sterile gloves, of course, sterile cotton swabs. So they use sterile cotton swabs as sponges on eye cases because it's nice to get to the blood or water fluid out of the way with the cotton swabs. Um, after that, BSS. If you don't know what BSS is for your eyes, that's balanced salt solution. So go ahead and make that note. Almost all cases you will use BSS on the eyes and we send the patient with balanced salt solution. Okay. After that, it starts talking about surgical intervention. So you can read through some of that and the practical considerations. What I want to hit are the things you should and should not do. So practical considerations. It does say talking and movement to a minimum because your patient's awake. That is true, but we have to talk and communicate during surgery. So I, what I want you to know is anytime it says that in your book, what it means is to think about the fact that your patient is hearing everything you're saying. So think about what you say before you say it. No uh-ohs, no whoopsies, anything like that, because that's gonna put your patient on high alert for no reason. So we're there to help them and comfort them and having them awake is something we're not used to. So keep that in mind, watch what you say when your patient's awake. After that, non-powdered gloves. So we like to not use the powdered gloves just like we don't want lint to get up on the field. That can block the surgeon's view. And we also don't want that powder inside the patient's eyes. So double reasons to not use powdered gloves. Okay, I talked about the next one, making sure to wipe off your instruments. Um, and then the microscope. I just wanna point out that every drape is different. Some microscope drapes just cover the bottom to where the surgeon can use it. So if they reach up too high, they'll contaminate. They're looking through the loops. They're not paying attention to that. That is your job to watch every move they make and tell them if they have contaminated something and not just say, hey, you contaminated, say, oh, you've contaminated your glove. I already got you a new one. Let's change your glove. So know the right way to approach it when contaminations happen. But that's what I want you to think about with the microscope. Every drape is completely different. So you gotta know where it's sterile and where it's not sterile. <clears throat> okay, on page 591, so it's still talking about your uh, practical considerations, but I want you to look at these charts. I want you to recognize the suture needles and suture materials for eye surgery. So suture needles, looking at the different kinds, we're used to round bodies and reverse cutting, right? What we're not used to seeing is spatula. So where it says spatula micro point, it's got a thin, thin flat profile. It's very specific. So this is most frequently used in eye surgery and I think it's very easy to remember because it's not like other surgeries. It's not cutting and reverse cutting. It's not a blunt needle. It's very specific, spatulated. So spatulated needles are used most frequently in eye surgery and also the spatula micropoint. So make sure you know that. And looking at your different suture types, there's so many different suture types. So I just want you to read through them and know what your options are for materials with the eye. Okay, now we can get into our surgeries. So I want to point out on 592 that you should read through how they're going to do the skin prep because it's a little bit different. But the idea is anything that's on your face, you might have to dilute that with a little bit of saline or water because we don't want to get anything inside of our eyes. For example, it tells you in your book to cleanse the eyelids first, then the eyelashes and the brow and the skin, and that you're going to use 5% ophthalmic solution. So this can be used different ways, but you want to be sure to dilute it if that's what your surgeon asked for. Your book doesn't really focus on that a lot, and a lot of surgeons I worked with they wanted that prep diluted because they know, even though we're prepping around the eye, it's gonna roll into the eye. We don't need prep in the eye, so at least we can dilute it so it won't irritate the eye as much. 
Okay. After that, again, read through it all. You're responsible for everything that's in your book, but I will move on to some of our procedures. So I will go through these quickly because you'll see that this is gonna be a very quick procedure. So example, your chalazium. So chalazians, look at it. You're gonna put the forceps specific for that case on there. You'll remove it and that's it. <laughs> you might use some cotton tip applicators. You might have a Raytech on the field, but that's it. There's no laps, there's no blades, there's no stuff to count. There's not a lot of stuff to do. So even though it can be painful for your patient and it could get more involved, they are usually very simple surgeries. So. Looking in your book, page 592, surgical repair of a chalazion. So know what glands these are around and why this is happening. Read through all of that. What I want you to see, and I want you to add this into your book, is this is a cyst-like structure. That's how you would describe a chalazion, a cyst-like structure. So looking at your bullet points in the center section of surgical anatomy and pathology, You'll see it's a small lump on the inner or outer surface of the eyelid caused by inflammation. And it's a reaction to material trapped inside that myobiomy gland. So it, that is trapped inside the gland and it's causing this inflammatory reaction. So it's inflamed, it's red, and now we have this cyst-like structure that we have to remove. That's what I want you to learn about this case. Uh, looking at your equipment, instruments, and supplies, I want you to know you'll need a needle tip or a bipolar for this one. So a regular bobby will not do it. That's too big and broad to go over this very small. Area and bobby will help us do that. Okay, after that, we can look at surgical repair of an entropion. So an entropion, this is your inward turning of your eye. So you can see it on the picture right here of this man that the eyelids are kind of drooping down, turning outward. So the eyelid consists of different layers, all of that anatomy you should read through and make sure you remember. Let's look at the center section of page 593. So in Tropian, abnormal inversion of the lower lid margins. That's a technical way to say it. You can see that lower lid dragging. Causes the eyelashes to rub against the cornea. This results in irritation, pain, and chronic tears for our patient. So this inward turning of the eyelid is why we are coming in to get this surgery repaired. So uncomfortable um, amongst many other things for your patient. So we will go in and surgically repair that. If you'll flip it over to page 594, you'll see what's different between these two cases. The scissors that they're gonna use are the Stevens tenotomy scissors. So another scissor that you need to know for eye surgery. Now, we'll use this in lots of other specialties, but Stevens tenotomy scissors will be used. Okay, so uh, let's keep going with 595. So our next one is the iridectomy. So on this one, it really focuses on the anatomy. And I do not because, man, it says it word for word perfectly in your book. So you really need to read through this section on page 595. I actually have made a list, too, of all of the videos that are on my YouTube channel. So it starts with the iridectomy. And this one, the anatomy is a little confusing. So I suggest you look at the anatomy watch the YouTube video. The first one's called laser iridotomy for glaucoma. So that's an iridotomy. The next one is an iridectomy. So you can watch them both. You could just watch the iridectomy if you want to focus on this, but I suggest with the rest of these eye procedures, you watch a video to understand and then read it. Read about the anatomy and then read the procedure because otherwise it won't make complete sense for you. Eye surgery is very different and hard to explain for, you know, explaining over lecture and explaining in your book. So they do a good job. You just have to see it to believe it. So iridectomy after you've watched a video. Uh, let's look at just the iris. I will hit just a little bit of anatomy. 
So you should remember what your iris is, but don't forget that it is a muscle. So thin circular muscle, it's suspended in the aqueous humor. Hopefully you got to dissect your eyeballs in class. So you got to see the difference between that aqueous and the vitreous humor in the eye. Um, let's look. You should also focus on where it talks about involuntary smooth muscle contractions. So it's talking about these muscles contracting involuntarily and it's going to regulate the amount of light entering the eye through that pupil. I want you to understand that process because it really affects glaucoma and we're going to be treating glaucoma on these eye surgeries. So I want you to understand how that muscle contracts. After that, know there are different chambers. Know there's an anterior and posterior chamber, and that is separate from your aqueous um, and vitreous uh, humor. So your anterior chamber is the space between the cornea and the iris. That's why you're looking at the iris right here. The aqueous fluid flows through the space to provide nourishment to the eye. It also helps it maintain the shape that it has because if there was no fluid in your eye, it would not have that round shape that it has. After that, the fluid's gonna exert the anterior chamber and then it's going to go through that canal of Schlem. So two terms as you're reading through, anterior chamber, canal of Schlem. After that, it's gonna go through a meshwork it says a trabeculate meshwork, but that's how the fluid is flowing through your eye. So that keeps your eye round, it keeps it lubricated, it allows you to blink without it being painful. So the eye anatomy is pretty amazing. Okay, I won't read any more anatomy. I try not to do that because I should not do an anatomy review for you because you learned it already, but definitely go through and read through this section. After that, let's go to the part where it talks about glaucoma. So angle closure glaucoma refers to the inability of the aqueous fluid to exit the eye. So that fluid isn't exiting the eye at the right point. So because it's not exiting the eye and going to that canal of Schlem like it's supposed to, it's gonna have a blockage. So due to the blockage by the iris, this is gonna raise your IOP, intraocular pressure, so the eye is filling up with pressure and it's going to create your condition called glaucoma. So I think this part also explains glaucoma very well for you too. Okay, so there's different types of iridectomy. There's three different types, so read through that, but mostly look at this anatomy I just talked about. So every anatomy portion I just talked about on 595 is pictured on 596. So again, I want you to focus on that aqueous hu humor and how it's gonna pass through that canal of Schlem. So I think the only thing that's not listed on that picture is canal of Schlem. And it talks about it in multiple bullet points, so you know to pay attention to it. Okay, that brings me to another instrument. So on page 597, You will see, I want you to make yourself a note. Now I can tell this by looking at it, but a question I've seen before is, what's an eye instrument that resembles an uncoiled metal paperclip? That is your back here, eye speculum. And if you look at it, it kind of does resemble an uncoiled metal paper, paper clip because it's a very simple instrument. And it's just going to keep that eye open during these types of eye surgeries. So we want to decrease that IOP, that intraocular pressure, and uh, treat this glaucoma on this patient. Okay, on page 598, you'll see a couple more instruments that you need to know. So your Pierce Culvery forceps, these are angled in a specific way, so they look very distinct, so it's easy to find. I've heard these called Culvery forceps. They take the first name off of it. Uh, same thing with your muscle hook. I've seen them just called a muscle hook instead of a Jameson muscle hook. And that muscle hook actually brings me right into the next procedure. So your strabismus correction. So with all of these, 
strabismus correction procedures, it's gonna go through the anatomy, but I want you to know they're gonna to have to use that muscle hook that I just went over during this case. And you'll see why as we go through the anatomy. So page 599, I'll go ahead and go to strabismus repair. So on this one, as I said, it hits the anatomy first. Make sure you go over it. So all your pictures on 599 and where it talks about your extrinsic muscles. You want to know your six extrinsic muscles. They're on page 600, the next page. So after you've memorized your six extrinsic muscles, I want you to kind of read through the functions also. That's not something you have to memorize, but I want you to read through the functions so you could understand if they're working on a specific muscle, it's gonna affect the patient in a specific way. So that's why we have all these different terms for the way the eye is going to rotate. So everything pictured on my page, I do want you to recognize those terms. So the eyes going in versus the eyes going out in all of your different terms. So let's look in your book. So you see your six extrinsic muscles, then you see your bullet points underneath it. Let's start there. So strabismus is, as you see, a misalignment or deviation of the eyes in any direction. So they're all strabismus repair. You're just learning extra terms for specific directions. So various forms of strabismus include Eostropia, so the eye is turned medially, cross-eyed, extropia, and then wall eyes. So as you're reading through these, I want you to know the specific terms in your book, the medical terms, and then I also want you to recognize the terms wall eyes and cross-eyed so that you recognize it and match it with that medical term. Okay, but all of these, they are going to be working with the muscle. So they'll be using that muscle hook. And then you can see on page 600, when you get to number two, they'll be using those Westcott scissors also. So look at both of those instruments and make sure you know them. Let's go to page 601. Another instrument they're going to use, this Castro Viejo caliper. So they're going to resect a specific amount of this muscle, so they might use a caliper to measure the exact amount of the muscle that they're going to use. So if you look at number seven on 601, they're, they're going to create a flap of muscle, and the muscle is measured and marked at the points of recession, so where they're going to make cuts and where they're going to sew it back. So sterile marker you'll need and a Castro Viejo caliper. Wand 601, that figure A and B is a very good, plain understanding of this case. So I want you to study that figure. Strabismus correction is a resection and then a recession. So two different things we're doing on strabismus repairs, resection and recession. Okay, what I also want you to look at is on page 602. It starts talking about uh, the muscle and how they're gonna sew it back. After that, it talks about when the patient is completely awake. So your last paragraph. Your patient's completely awake, but not more than 24 hours after surgery, this adjustment is performed. So that means they can adjust it after the fact, and that's actually their routine. So they routinely do it this way with the suture and then coming back and readjusting it. So I want you to know the timeline. You can see the readjustment on figure 16-16 recession by adjustable suture. So they place the suture, but then they come in another time and get it adjusted. I want you to know that time frame. So after anesthesia is worn off, the patient's completely awake, but not more than 24 hours after surgery. Then this adjustment is performed. Okay. That was your strabismus repair. And here is what I want you to see what the eye surgery is really gonna look like. So you have a small fenestration in your drape, so only the eye is draped out. Your patient is awake. They're in this very uncomfortable eye speculum as we are sewn on that muscle for the strabismus. So eye surgery is very different than other specialties. Let's go to scleral buckle. So on page 603, scleral buckle. You'll see a good idea of what the case is gonna look like. You'll also see that band they're going to put around the eye to help the scleral buckle. So let's look in your book, 603. 
your surgical anatomy and pathology, the retina is gonna make up the inner tunic of your eye. That's that nervous membrane where the light and the images are actually received. So know what your retina is, know that it makes up that inner tunic of the eye. And it talks about posteriorly. So know the posterior anatomy of the eye. That retina is continuous with the optic nerve. Again, if you did that eye dissection in class, then that will help you with that information. Hopefully you have a good visual in your mind of what that looks like. So that section where it talks about posteriorly and then anteriorly, I really want you to focus on that. The anterior portion extends all the way up to the ciliary body, then the sensory layer, the rods and the cones allow for seeing different shades. So if you don't remember this part of anatomy, please review, it writes it all out for you again. So your rods allow you to see shades of gray and dim light, general shapes and outlines. Your cones provide that color vision and allow you to see sharp images. So know your retinal structures, your cones and your rods, and know them as retinal structures. Okay, one other anatomy portion I want you to focus on, your central fovea. Within that center structure is a small depression called the central fovea. This contains only the cones and is in the area of highest visual acuity of your eye. So as you're reading through this, you can see what happens with a retinal detachment versus a where the retina becomes completely detached, not just torn. Uh, and it talks about how the progression is gonna go for the patient. So retinal detachment occurs, uh, separation happens from the retina from the chorid plexus. Uh, from there, the vision is lost wherever the retina has been detached. So is vision lost completely? No, just where the retina has been detached. That's what's keeping you from seeing. Uh, eventually, that entire retina can become detached and then all useful vision of the eye will be lost. So then we would have to just go in and remove the eye if that's what the patient wanted. So a lot of this eye surgery, like many other surgeries, it's a lot of the patient's choice. So if they went to the patient and said, you've lost vision in this eye, you know, they have choices on decisions on what they want to do with their eye, whether they want a prosthetic, they wanna keep what they have, they wanna try for repairs, they have options. Okay. I think on this one, let's go ahead and flip over because it's got great pictures on 604. So on 604, you can actually see what they're going to be doing in this procedure. And as I said, it's not gonna make any sense to you unless you watch a video to go with it on these but these pictures break it down step by step so you can see that they're making an incision in the eye, but it's in the side of the eye. So you can see that on letter D and E on page 604. So look at the pictures and watch a video of this one for sure. Let's look at page 605. There's one thing I want to point out for this one. So number six, I wanna point out we talked about diathermy. You ain't using cryotherapy or cryoprobe to seal some of these tears. So I wanna point out right there on number six, that cryoprobe, that's the handheld portion of the cryotherapy, um, is gonna be used for the same purpose. So it says diathermy may also be used for the same purpose. Cryotherapy has become the preferred method. I want you to recognize that section because cryotherapy is what's preferred now and that's what you're going to be using. So they wrote that in there for a reason to update it. Looking at number seven, you'll see that cryotherapy or diothermy, which either one that has been used, um, is gonna be applied to those holes. So it's gonna to try to help seal those holes. After that, they can start getting their explant. So this is that band that is going to be put around the eye that you see right there. So the chosen explants are gonna be soaked in antibiotic saline solution. Look at number 10 on this page. So during this procedure, the
the patient might, but still filling up the eye with gas. But if you think about it, we do that in surgery all the time. So we're going to inject with intraocular gas that's going to create pressure on the retina while the subretina fluid, all the other fluid, is reabsorbed and the scars are going to form. So these gases, you can see the numbers that are included, but I just want you to be able to recognize those. So if you saw them on a preference card, you recognize those as gases that you're gonna use during your ophthalmic surgery. Because of bubbles, I will go to the bottom of 605. Your one, two, third bullet, flying contraindicated if a gas bubble is in the eye. So that means you can get gas bubbles in the eye and you want to watch out for that. So just like everything else we do in surgery, we do not like bubbles. That distracts from our view and kind of, sometimes it can mix you up. It can make the surgeon think there's something there that's not. Say, oh, is that something I need to repair? No, it's just a bubble. You do always want to avoid bubbles on your cases. But anyways, this is your scleral buckle repair and you can see where that silicone patch is going to be placed or the band completely around the eye. Very interesting case. After that, we can go to DCR. So this is dacryocystorhinostomy, or you can just say DCR so you don't have to explain all of that. So with DCR, you need to know where the lacrimal ducts are and how the drainage system works. And this picture explains it very well, I think. So your lacrimal system, know that it starts with the glands, know that you have ducts, know where the secretion is happening. Let's talk about the fluid in the eye. So the fluid is carried away by the lacrimal canals into the lacrimal sac. This is along the nasolacrimal duct and it goes into the cavity of the nose. So that's a lot of information. I want you to know the flow, the system in which it flows, the order in which it flows. The lacrimal gland is located within the upper eyelid on the outer angle of the orbit. So everybody knows where their lacrimal glands are, but how would you describe it? I want you to rec recognize it as simple layman's terms note on the side. Your lacrimal duct are gonna drain the tears into your nasal cavity. So we're skipping all that anatomy in the center that you do need to know, but layman's terms, lacrimal ducts drain the tears into your nasal cavity. Okay, after you read through your anatomy, I want you to notice that they're gonna have a specific tray for this one. So equipment, instruments, and supplies, they have a specific set for this case. I'd like to more focus on the medication used on this case, case. so page 607. 607, you'll see after general anesthesia, they're gonna use some local anesthetic. Local anesthetic is a little bit different for eye surgery, so that's why you want to learn these medications. So local anesthetic, tetracaine 1% with epinephrine. Now I've told you in class that epinephrine is always gonna be in bright red. So it'll be in bright red to tell you, not only it's epi, but specifically in your book, it says it's one to 500,000. So it's telling you how much epi is in it compared to the rest of the liquid, the tetracaine that's in the bottle. So pay attention to that. But this is actually going to be put directly into that conjunctival sac. So that's what is a little bit different on this one. So tetracaine, if you don't know what that is, I want you to know that this one's going to numb just the surface. So lidocaine, marcaine, other things we use, we inject deeper into the body to really numb the whole area. This is just gonna numb the surface. On your procedural considerations, I want you to see that this is also gonna help control the bleeding intraoperatively and provide some pain relief and immediate post-op pain relief for your patient. Okay. So after DCR, I want you to focus on the anatomy more on that one. I'm gonna to go to enucleation. I have not done a lot of eye surgery because I focused on other specialties, but one case that I did multiple times was an enucleation. So eye trauma, unfortunately, led to enucleation for 
these patients. And I actually have a separate slide just for nucleation that I will share with you. So on a nucleation, I want you to read through the difference between a nucleation and evisceration in your book. So a nucleation is excision of the eye, and this could be to cancer, this could be to trauma, excessive damage, anything like that. Evisceration is different. That's what I want you to know from this. Evisceration allows the retention of the sclera in the extrinsic muscles of the eye. So that means you'll be able to move your eye. If you have those muscles, you'll be able to move your eye. It eliminates corneal sensitivity. It allows the patient to wear a prosthetic eye that will have mobility and better cosmetic result. So are they gonna get an implant? Yes, but they will be able to move their eye naturally. So it's gonna look more natural. It's gonna look where they look. So very big difference between a nucleation and evisceration, and I want you to know the difference. After that, this is a great lineup of what you need to do in a nucleation. It's got the right eye retractor, it's got a little muscle hook, some good pickups. I see some tenotomy scissors and some iris scissors. That's what you need to do in a nucleation. The only thing that's different is this a nucleation spoon. That's the only instrument that you probably haven't seen yet. So it actually goes directly behind the eye, just like a spoon. That little divot is for that optic nerve. So they're gonna pull up and make that cut. So very shocking, at least for me, to see the first time to just see somebody's eye just cut out. So you have to make sure that you are mentally prepared for that one. But if you think about it, it is a very cool procedure because sometimes if it's a big trauma, they could be bleeding behind that eye. There could be more nerve damage happening as we're pulling on that optic nerve. So the eye needs to be removed. So it's a necessary thing that has to be done and you can help do this for your patient. Okay, after a nucleation, I will go to keratinoplasty. So this one you can see really good before and after pictures on this one. So keratoplasty or a corneal transplant, more commonly called. So this one also goes, goes over the anatomy and I want you to focus on that. So your external tunic, I actually separated it there for you. So hopefully you can better understand that anatomy. So this is your fibrous and transparent section, that external tunic. What can be difficult is if you're Googling things as you're studying, sometimes you'll get different terms like um, external tunic right there fibrous and transparent. That might get you mixed up, might have a different name somewhere else. They might have a different name for vascular tunic. So make sure you are using the terms that are in your book. If you're ever unsure about something, go back to your anatomy book. That will answer your questions correctly. Okay, so anatomy, your sclera and your cornea from the external tunic, as you see there, of your eye. Both are fibrous in structure and transparent. So we're talking about the structure. They're fibrous and transparent. Don't let that mix up the names of the tunics. Okay, after that, you can read through some more anatomy, but I'll hit the cornea. So I'm on the right side of page 610. The cornea allows that light into the eye and bends the light rays. So it refracts the light rays, if you need to write that word in. This is going to help the lens focus upon that retina. After that, it talks about how you can get a cloudy or cornea, a cloudy or damaged corneal tissue. So, if not perfectly clear, replacing that cloudy or damaged corneal tissue with healthy donor tissue will be done with a corneal transplant. So this is going to correct their vision, as you can see easily, because it's cloudy and now it is not. So now they can see easily. On page 611, I want to point out a specific thing they're going to use on this procedure. So you see normal headrest, ophthalmic microscope, normal things. Then I want you to look at corneal procedure set. So this includes trephine or Cottingham punch, and I will explain that. You need a specific instrument for this case, and it is that trephine or that Cottingham punch. After that, your practical considerations. I want you to realize that this corneal tissue is coming from a bank. 
So an eye bank procures the tissue and examines it and stores it until it's needed. So they can store these for quite a while, but you need to know that these are coming from donors. So this again is not an example where you want to oopsie drop something on the ground. You don't have that option, you're not going to have another one. So no room for mistakes when it comes to transplants of any kind, but corneal transplants too. So where it says on your third bullet point on page 611 of your practical considerations, the donor tissue is screened and tested for the presence of communicable diseases. So this is the cornea specifically, and it's getting into why. So communicable diseases such as hepatitis HIV or crutzfeld jacobs disease. So hopefully you remember crutzfeld jacobs disease. Sometimes people refer to it as mad cow disease. That is one that we're going to throw the instruments in the trash. We can't sterilize it and kill it. So if we do decide to 